In the early months of 1962, Marilyn Monroe was set to go before the cameras for her 30th film. 503. 504. <laughs> She'd been absent from the screen for over a year. And the light comedy Something's Got to Give would offer something of a comeback. <laughs> Come on. What is so refreshing? Legendary filmmaker George Cukor was brought in to direct. 74. And cast opposite Marilyn would be two of the world's most gifted and glamorous stars. Dean Martin. Ellen! Get out of there! And Sid Charisse. Not like that! Go in and change! The film would also include a small army of Hollywood's most accomplished and respected character actors. Excuse me, are you being helped? Are you being waited on? Right, sure. <laughs> well, here we go. Let's go. But only eight weeks after production began, Marilyn Monroe was fired. Two months later, the star was found dead of an apparent sleeping pill overdose. Something's Got to Give became one of the most talked about unfinished films in Hollywood history. For nearly four decades, 500 minutes of unedited footage sat in storage in the vaults at 20th Century Fox. The story of the film and of Marilyn's tragic final days was seemingly lost. Lost until now. Cut it, cut it, cut it. Cut. You see that man? That's Max Fabian, the producer. Now go and do yourself some good. Why do they always look like unhappy rabbits? Because that's what they are. Now go and make him happy. By January of 1962, Marilyn Monroe had been 20th Century Fox's most bankable star for over a decade. You can tell him from me, I think he's simply a doll. And I couldn't be crazy about these old Eastern customs. Her 20 pictures for the studio had grossed over $200 million at the box office, making Marilyn Fox's biggest commodity since Shirley Temple. But Monroe hadn't worked for her home studio in almost two years, and Fox was facing serious financial problems due to costly delays on the epic production of Cleopatra. The studio needed Marilyn back at work as soon as possible. To that end, they sent veteran producer David Brown to entice the star with a script for a light bedroom comedy entitled, Something's Got to Give. Marilyn really didn't want to make Something's Got to Give. She was under a slave contract at that time to 20th Century Fox, having made films away from 20th Century Fox, and the studio was insisting that she live up to the contract, and this was given to her. Something's Got to Give was a modern remake of the 1940 screwball comedy My Favorite Wife, which had starred Cary Grant and Irene Dunn. Marilyn was to play a woman who returns home after five years stranded on a tropical island, only to find herself legally declared dead and her husband newly remarried. The film would be co-produced by 20th Century Fox and Marilyn Monroe Productions, a company set up in 1955 to give Marilyn more creative control over her projects. Is it true that you uh, submitted a list of directors that you would work with? I would rather say uh, that I have direct approval, and that is true. This you think is important? Yes, it is. Very important to me. In September 1961, Marilyn submitted a list of directors that she would agree to work with. It included some of the industry's most accomplished names, among them George Cukor. But after a difficult experience with her during the filming of the 1960 comedy Let's Make Love, Cukor expressed misgivings about working with Marilyn again. Ray, I've never been so humiliated in my life. The least you could have done is tell me who you are. Well. You know, the story in Hollywood is always that you owe somebody a picture. You got out of one, but then you have to do another or something. And I think it worked out that Fox suggested Cukor, this picture, and he owed them a picture for something else. 
In January of 1962, Hugh Core reluctantly signed on to the film. Producer David Brown now had a major director and a star attached to the project. But he had no final script, despite the continued effort of Fox's staff writer Arnold Schulman. He was a great writer, but I was somewhat alarmed when I passed his office and saw that he had removed his desk and was writing in a yoga position. Bear in mind that the myth of Hollywood is far less than the reality. But the producers knew they faced problems much bigger and more difficult than script rewrites. Monroe's tardiness was now legendary in Hollywood. She had been blamed for creating costly delays on nearly every film in which she starred. To make matters worse, her four-year marriage to playwright Arthur Miller had just ended in divorce, and the actress was finding consolation from a growing dependency on pills and alcohol. Concerned that Marilyn's emotional problems would only add to Fox's growing financial woes, studio chief Peter Levathes recruited the help of Marilyn's psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson. Levathes hoped that Greenson would control the star's erratic behavior, but what the doctor began controlling was something's got to give. His first move was to push out David Brown in favor of his friend, producer Henry Weinstein. I got a call on a Sunday from the then heads of the studio. And they said, could I come and see him? And I went down there and they gave me the script of uh, something's got to give. And I was told not to say anything to anybody about it. I was told of my impending removal by my future partner and best friend Richard Zanuck who said I was in the elevator and this guy Henry Weinstein was carrying a script of something's got to give. Watch your back. Well, I did and there was an arrow in it. Director George Cukor was furious at David Brown's dismissal and his resentment lingered as Henry Weinstein came on board. I did whatever Cukor didn't want to do and I just did it. I thought he was right from the beginning difficult with the script and everything else. Two distinct centers of power began emerging on the set. One between Marilyn and Henry Weinstein and the other between George Cukor and his associate producer and art director, Gene Allen. But both sides agreed on one thing. The script still needed work. Oscar winner Natalie Johnson was brought in to complete a series of rewrites. Johnson had written How to Marry a Millionaire, which had been a great success for Fox and Marilyn. Do you know who I'd like to marry? Who? Rockefeller. Which one? I don't care. Now Johnson and Monroe would be working together to update Something's Got to Give. He said to her, Now Marilyn, wherever you think the line is out of character, put a cross. Where you think the line is not funny enough, put a double cross. Fine. I leave happy. I don't hear from him for a week. I call her analyst Romy and I said, what is the problem? And he said, why did Nunley use the word double cross? I said, what do you mean? He said, Nunley once gave her a picture which she turned down and she now thinks he's going to get back at her. But despite her fears, Marilyn slowly came to trust Johnson. She loved his witty interpretation of the story, as did producer Henry Weinstein. Not only Johnson, I think, was who Marilyn was working with to get a story that she would approve. I don't know whether they were keeping Cukor involved. One of the mistakes I made was I didn't uh, confer with Cukor which I should have done. It may have saved me problems towards the end. I was reluctant to do so because Cuco was working with Gene Allen and I just thought I would undercut all of that. Cuco was furious to be left out of the meetings. He felt that Johnson's version strayed too far from the original charm of my favorite wife. Within two months, Nunnally Johnson was replaced with a writer named Walter Bernstein. Johnson had written a script and I have no idea whether he then had whatever reason he had left it, whether he had died or whether uh, uh, I really didn't know. All I knew was that uh, uh, I got a call from George Cukor. By now, 
Script rewrites alone had brought the production $300,000 over budget, a problem that only seemed to mirror the larger financial crisis confronting 20th Century Fox. Cleopatra was still running massively over budget, and Fox was panicking from the escalating costs. The company was going broke, and fast. First we got notes that we should water our own plants because the greens men had been fired. Then we got notes that the cafeteria was going to be closed. There was nobody there. So I said, don't worry about it. I'm eating my plants. <laughs> it's true. I mean, there was no, it, was, it was like a ghost town. A dark cloud seemed to hover over the production of Something's Got to Give. And Marilyn Monroe now had more to accomplish and more to prove than ever before. By late March 1962, there were only three short weeks left before the first day of principal photography. The race was on to meet the tight deadline. As George Cukor and Walter Bernstein pounded out a new draft of the script, associate producer Gene Allen oversaw completion of the set, an exact replica of Cukor's own home and backyard. The costume department worked overtime to pull the wardrobe together for the entire cast. And producer Henry Weinstein struggled to keep track of Marilyn Monroe. He was a prisoner, really, of the situation. I had very little to do with him. His main preoccupation was Marilyn, you know, how to get her there, how to keep her working, you know, and it was thankless. It was just a thankless job. On April 10th, the punctual Marilyn arrived on the set for makeup and costume tests. But to her surprise, George Cukor did not show up to supervise and direct. And I think it was a big mistake for Cukor not to have done that because she was there at her best and she had to take it as a put down. I'm sure she did. But despite Cukor's absence, Marilyn's performance convinced everyone that she was in top form. so happy because they were brilliant. I mean, she looked extraordinary. She was at her best. Weinstein couldn't wait to share his enthusiasm with the star herself. But when Marilyn was several hours late for their scheduled meeting, the producer raced over to her home in nearby Brentwood. When I come there and she's spread across her bed, practically new and really out. So I called Romy up and then we called her and Turnus and uh, they came running over. And this was the first time and I knew we were in trouble. Weinstein was shocked at the sight of Marilyn Monroe, unconscious from an apparent overdose of sleeping pills. And I went to the studio and I said, Listen, we got to postpone this picture. I don't think she's going to be ready. We're going to start shooting in about three weeks. And said, what happened? She said, oh, no, you're being melodramatic. I said, I tell you, the girl is not able to do this yet. I said, if I came and told you she just had a heart attack, what would you do? She said, well, we, we would wait. I said, what's the difference? She says, she had a heart attack. We couldn't get insurance. With this, we can't. 